recorded. Oh, just a second. We might have to, it said request permission. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to pause. Go. This guest interview on qualitative methods is with Dr. Peter Smagorinsky. He received his PhD in English education from the University of Chicago in 1989. Dr. Smagorinsky is the Distinguished Research Professor of English Education in the Mary Frances Early College of Education in the Department of Language and Literacy Education at the University of Georgia. He is also a Distinguished Visiting Scholar at the Universidad de Guadalajara in Jalisco, Mexico. Dr. Smagorinsky has received numerous awards for his research and publications, teaching, service, and cumulative career achievement. His most recent award, received in 2020, is the Horace Mann League Outstanding Public Educator Award, presented to an outstanding educator who has, over their career, supported public education. Dr. Smagorinsky serves as the faculty advisor for the Journal of Language and Literacy Education. His research interests include adapting Gotsky's work to literacy and literacy education, neurodiversity, school culture, and teacher education. Dr. Smagorinsky's most recent books, published in 2020, are Learning to Teach English and Language Arts, a Vygotskyan Perspective on Beginning Teachers' Pedagogical Concept Development, and a co-edited book, for which he is also the series editor, entitled Developing Culturally and Historically Sensitive Teacher Education, Global Lessons from a Literacy Education Program. This book is based on his work in Guadalajara. You can view his other publications on the CV you will have access to on our course learning platform. So we'll begin the interview now. To begin, Dr. Smagorinsky, can you describe your current area of research, including what led you to pursue this current area of research? Well, before I start, there is a, there's a slight correction. The, uh, the Spanish J is an H, so it's Jalisco. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, one of those letters that seems to have 100 pronounce, pronunciations. So if you're in uh, Eastern Europe, it's a, it's, a, it's a Y sound. So it's Sarajevo. Oh, okay. uh, uh, in fact, Yugoslavia was originally spelled with a J. So it's just, uh, so Jalisco, Mexico is where, uh, is, the, is the Mexican state that uh, the city of Guadalajara is in. So just okay, thank you. I need to update my Spanish skills. I know, well, I'm on Duolingo and I know the difference between a apple and a banana. I just want you to, you know, <laughs> and I can pick them out. I am a, I passed the cognitive test. I can tell them apart by the photographs. Okay. <laughs> I just want to brag about that. It's a very important, very important. <laughs> very important skill. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wish research were that important, were that uh, easy, but uh, it's actually quite hard. I, I labor over the work that I do. Um, I'm actually doing a lot of different things, so it's, it's difficult to say what, what the thing I'm doing is. Uh, I've been, I worked with a Brazilian student all last year and we, we've uh, developed some papers on uh, the English, the TESOL program in uh, uh, Londrina, Brazil. And we're looking at such things as the cultural mismatches between students' socialization and this very Western schedule that had everything beginning and ending on particular times. The, 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 the fluid time conception of the students doesn't match the precise schedule of when students are supposed to be uh, expected to attend classes. So I thought it was an interesting uh, cultural analysis of the whole idea that you can heavily schedule people who are who show up when they're ready to show up. And uh, because attendance was a huge problem in this program, and when we looked at it, it was pretty clear that, the, that, that, that they're trying to westernize Brazilian education with non-westernized people. And that doesn't fit that well, it turns out. Uh, so I did that. I'm looking, uh, I'm uh, analyzing discussions uh, from a class that I taught here, a service learning class. And these are book club discussions. 
uh, conducted among university students on diversity issues. And I think these are, I, I really like this work. Um, I like the class, first of all. Uh, uh, it's a, the, the design is very unique because we don't, it, it's, it's very unconventional because they, the students run the class and they uh, choose what they'll read in book club settings. They have discussions of them and then they lead their classmates in an exploration of the issues they found most salient. And so they get exposure to a huge range of books. And um, in, a, in a class that is um, designed to promote diversity in a Southern conservative state, you can only often get pushback against from professor who was up there explaining to the students why their families are all wrong about everything and why they shouldn't go to church and why they, you know, the, you know, the, the routines. Uh, there's, it can get pretty preachy and I, I don't really want them to be converted to my way of seeing things, but I do want them to think deeply through why they believe what they do. And so this book club setting gives them an opportunity to engage with one another, more or less out of earshot of me, and then to lead their classmates in, um, in discussions of what they find interesting about whether they chose a book on race relations or gender or popular culture or any of these issues. They can, uh, uh, it's, they discuss it on their own terms. And I think that their fellow students are more receptive to one another than they are to an adult. Um, and the, you know, the expression, they're cramming it down my throat. Uh, that, they don't cram it down each other's throat. They really present these things in very uh, open-minded ways. And so one of the things that we, we just finished an article, um, Lindy Johnson's a former student of mine, actually William and Mary in Virginia. And we started this work a long time ago when she was a graduate student, she just got tenure. And um, so we're still trying to make sense of these, but we, we, we identified something called empathic framing uh, which became the focus of that article. And um, what we do is we, I recorded all the discussions over the course of the semester. And so, um, or most of them, I should say. And so we're analyzing these book club discussions among, in that, in that group, there were four students. And what we keep noticing is that they, they I don't know if you quite call it a pivot, but they, they reconceive a population that they either hadn't known much about or had had stereotypical um, perspectives on. And it's very, we have a, the University of Georgia has a very, it's a conservative state. Um, it's a, we have conservative students and that's, you know, that's who they are, that they're my students and I love them. Um, but they'll, they'll, they'll initiate a more empathic way of thinking by making an emotional connection to either a person they're tutoring, tutoring in the alternative school in town, that's another dimension of the class, or that it is used um, as an illustration in research that they're reading for the book that they chose. And they'll say, I never thought of it like that. You know, wow, I've never, I wonder what it's like to be that person. Now, there, there are certain kind of key words that you can identify that signal that they're making an emotional connection that generates an empathic reframing of how they saw that person. So there was a, one instance that I like was a girl, a girl, a young woman in the class. Uh, I think they're usually sophomores. Um, she, was, she was doing her tutoring at the alternative school with a kid who had three kids of his own. Uh, and the school actually has a nursery to accommodate, it was the alternative school, so they have a nursery to accommodate students who are parents, and many of them are. And, and she said, I was talking to my student, and he said, they're taking up a collection for a hurricane in Haiti. He said, I got three kids. <laughs> I don't have any money to give away to Haiti. Yeah. Uh, but it was this, it was, she had this emotional connection to his response. She felt what it felt in a way that she'd never seen the world from the standpoint of someone that I think she previously would have believed to be an irresponsible, sexually profligate teenager. Yeah. And she saw him as a responsible, hardworking father. 
mm -hmm. instead. That's a huge shift in perspective. Yeah. And this, this, this sort of turnaround, they always talk about how eye-opening it is to go into that school. And you do get a lot of students in there who, who've only known the kind of kid who's in that school through stereotype before, mm -hmm. through the media, through uh, the people that they know. And they get to know a kid and develop a relationship with them, or they, and in conjunction with reading about similar sorts of issues. And it's not that they reason their way into this, it's driven emotionally. And uh, my, my efforts to understand how people develop concepts over time increasingly show that concept development is actually not a solely cognitive uh, use of the mind. Mm -hmm. Emotional, emotional uh, motivation is built into thinking mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and inescapably. So um, that's that's a study we just put that out. But in the same in the same data set, we're looking at um, something we call a projected teacher identity, and that's in these discussions they're continually saying they you know they're in response to there, there's a book for instance that, that this group read, um, and I forget the title of it, but it was uh, the the theme was how students and teachers mutually burn each other out. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a kind of depressing book, but it's also kind of true. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things that they would do is project themselves as teachers in the future. Wow, when I'm a teacher, maybe to make sure that this kid doesn't feel, it, maybe helping a kid too much is actually works against that kid's sense of inclusion with peers. In other mm -hmm. words, if a kid is getting excluded in the cafeteria and I go over and do something about it, am I actually alienating the kid further from peers mm -hmm. by, by, by seeming to do something kind? And so they'll say, okay, when I'm a teacher, what am I going to do? So they're, they're continually projecting themselves into a, um, uh, the, the working title of this is Enmi Camino, on my path, on my on my on my road. Oh, I like that uh, Spanish phrase. Um, uh, that, so the, the notion of the Camino is actually very powerful in in Mexico. I don't know if it's throughout Latin America or Spanish, but it's a it's a um, it's your sense of destiny. Oh, okay. Uh, in fact, there's a song by a band called Mana where they rhyme. Um, uh, Destino with um, uh, Camino. Oh, that's that. Bundle, works so they bundle them. So destiny and, and your path are the same. Now, what other research I've done shows that they don't necessarily follow that path, hmm. but they set it. And if you're thinking conceptually, the way you set your path is done according to how you conceptualize your your life's work. And, and the importance of things. So their, their concept development has many, many dimensions and we're starting to be able to tease out some of them as they show up in the data. Mm. And so I'm, I'm also studying uh, a teacher who is, I've done, I was able to collect what we call longitudinal data, uh, which is studying something over time. Uh, because some of the students in these book clubs, and these are from 2012, maybe 2011, um, some of them have allowed me to interview them every semester since then. So I've got nearly a decade of following them. Oh wow! Uh, and we're we're close to finishing the the analysis of a full set of interviews from one of them. And that's and it's in things like that that we're finding that the path that they set can be disrupted and needs to be reset. Mm. So in, in, in prior studies of this sort that I've done, or of a, actually a slightly different sort, I guess I call it short longitudinal covering like three years, they'll, uh, uh, several of the teachers had fairly idealistic notions of, um, of kids. 
you know, if I if I if I'm if I'm there and I'm wonderful and if I, and, and I set up delightful things, the kids will do them. And it turns out they don't. <laughs> <laughs> So they had to go through these resets where they would say things, I hate the teacher I become. This is not me, mm. uh, that sort of thing. And, but the me that, that they're not was the me that they'd set as this, uh, you know, on their Camino, on this, on this path that they'd set as in the more idealistic setting of a university. Mm -hmm. And then they got out there with kids who don't care about school and had to redirect, you know, I guess, you know, you, the popular term might be pivot to a different identity and a different sense of what they needed to do. And it was more of a hard ass uh, uh, disciplinarian, exactly who they said they didn't want to be. Mm. So setting the path is important, but it's not permanent. That road's gonna take a lot of turns and it, yeah. it'll change directions. It'll be going toward different things eventually. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm currently doing. Um, and I'm doing other things too, but those are the ones that are the, that are the most immediate in, in, uh, in the research part of my life. Wonderful. So building on those, um, can you talk a little bit about how, like the theory that informs how you approach examining those, those different, um, different issues and analyzing those different um, uh, book groups and things like that and kind of the, the philosophical assumptions that you bring to studying it? Sure. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very indebted to uh, Lev Vygotsky, uh, Soviet psychologist, cultural psychologist from uh, close to 100 years ago. Um, who lived in a very different time and different place. And so you have to, you always have to adapt to Vygotsky. You can't necessarily just pick him up wholesale. For instance, he talks about writing, but his, to him, writing was done with a pen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had a very uh, kind of a remote audience. Very much the kind of writing I did at the until the person, until I had a personal computer and the and internet. So you can't, you know, he, there was not, there's nothing in his conception that can account for the immediacy of, of a chat box. Mm -hmm. You are writing that or social media or any of those things. It was a very much more disciplined, deliberate uh, form of expression than I think most people today use in most of their writing. So mm -hmm. you can't, you can't really say Vygotsky said this, therefore now it's the same. Yeah. Um, but there are some uh, dimensions of his approach that are, I think, going to be hard to find exceptions to. Uh, and so he was a developmental psychologist. In other words, he was interested in how people become who they are over time, particularly in relation to other people. That's very key. Uh, so this notion of social mediation produces in a person how that person views the world. Um, and that's why, I say, in a southern conservative state, the next generation of people tends to be conservative, mm -hmm. right, because of, of, the, of the environment that they grow up in and, and you know, in a different, and, uh, a different form of, con form of conservatism might be available in Istanbul, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, I think that from the standpoint of human development, Vygotsky is very uh, provocative and very useful in studying how people develop. And his notion of development, again, was very social and also oriented toward developing concepts. And so that's why he's a really good fit with the work on concept development that I yeah. do in, in, when I study teachers, especially. Um, but it's also the, the role of culture is very critical in there as well, uh, because the, every school has a culture, every teacher ed program has a culture, uh, every family has a culture, you know, communities, they don't all say the same thing. And so in one of the conclusions that I've come to uh, and I'm hardly unique, I'm hardly the original here. I mean, one of the things I do is I, Walt Whitman, 
uh, because he is the one who said, I am uh, something like, I am multitudes. And what he's saying is that, and you could relate this to more current Bakhtinian theory, I hear many voices in my head. I am made up of all that I hear mm -hmm. and all that I engage with. And all that is contradictory. And so, uh, say, teachers might have in their bones, based on years of socialization, have internalized the idea that a story has a meaning and it's the teacher's job to help the kids see what it is. Mm -hmm. right? So teachers will talk about that and in, in, will, will talk about how they want discussions to be open-ended and let kids construct their own interpretations. That's a different, that's a very different value that they've internalized often from teacher education. Mm -hmm. But when they're actually in a classroom, you can see the tension is irresolvable. And that what they'll tend to do is lead them toward the right interpretation. Mm -hmm. now, that might not just be a conflict within themselves, it might be something that's in the curriculum. It might be something that's on a standardized test. And I, I have examples of teachers saying, I hate the way I led that discussion because I don't agree with the interpretation, but it's the one they have to know to do well on the test. Yeah. So there's this, uh, there's a there's a book on um, uh, evolutionary um, evolutionary psychology uh, that I've used to inform some of this work, and one of their conclusions is that it, it is computationally impossible for a human being to be consistent. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Because there are too many variables, there are too many uh, socialization factors in the environment for us to be just a pure ideological being. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I remember reading when Obama was president, there's a really left, lefty uh, uh, journal called The Nation, and they're constantly badgering him about not being progressive enough. But where he was as a politician, you can't be wholly progressive. Mm -hmm. right? You have to make compromises. You have to do things you might not even believe in. Um, and as president, you know, he was doing things like uh, uh, precipitating these drone attacks, which would seem to go against everything someone like him would believe in, but he was doing them because you can't, you're not, you're not in a pure theory class when you're the president. You have to do stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You may, and, and it can be very, very contradictory. So this is, it's, it's helped me, um, it's helped me be very sympathetic toward especially young teachers when they get out in the field and are, are wildly inconsistent in what, between what they do and what they say, mm -hmm. uh, between what they do and what they do. Um, you, know, they, if, you know, if you go to uh, an English staff room, you'll have a writing project person, you'll have an old school formalist, you'll have a, you know, a test driven person, you'll have a grammarian, you know, you'll have, and they'll all be trying to lead you in different directions. Mm -hmm. I'll be giving you materials that lead you down their, their Camino. And you, what you, that's why teachers appear often to be inconsistent and, um, and unreliable. And I think that that's perfectly, it, it's what you ought to expect out of people, not what you should be disappointed in them for. Mm. And we should try to be consistent. We could try to, we should try to have coherence. But it, you just can't as a person. So, that, so Vygotsky has been very useful to me in understanding what I see in the data. Um, in fact, we have one of the articles we published a couple of years ago. Um, I, I got one of my former, we we're trying to put a chart down that said, you know, there's influence from the character education movement. And there's, in, you know, there's influence from the state test. And there's influence from teacher ed saying, forget the state test. And there's... Uh, Ed TPA shelling you in this direction, and the department chair saying, "No, no, you know you've got to do this." And so we were trying to, we couldn't figure out how to represent this in a way that was easy to do. And so I got uh, Michelle Zoss as a former student of mine, very good artist. She's at Georgia State, and we got her to draw a picture of a of a teacher. 
kind of walking down a boulevard, turning her head, surrounded by competing, uh, like I guess you call them sirens or whatever, trying to get them to come her their way. Okay. And not really knowing which way to turn or go. Mm. And I think that that's a dilemma that students face. And I'm not sure, I, I don't know what I would be able to do if I didn't have the Vygotskyan reading. Um, but that, it really helped me to be able to interpret what was going on, not as deficiencies in teachers, but as normal human uh, ways of being. Mm -hmm. And that's reflected in, our, in what we experience in daily life too, in relationships and yep. just how we react to the world. That's, that's really helpful. Um, so the next uh, question I have is, is related to, so the, what you're, the things you're studying, you filter those through the Vygotskyan theory. Mm -hmm. um, and the questions you pose are also really important. And one of the things that I try to help students see is that the research questions that you pursue sure. always should determine the research method and not vice versa. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your, the questions or these, these things that you're examining and then how that informs the, the method you use in your studies. So the, the first thing I'd say, and I, I think it took me a while to figure this out, the questions you pose to collect data may not be exactly the same as the questions you pose to, to parse out studies from data mm -hmm. once it's collected. So when we started, we, I was funded by something called the Center on English Learning and Achievement, uh, 1996 to 2001. And uh, that's where I started doing these teacher ed studies. And I worked originally with um, two West Coast researchers, Pam Grossman, who's now the dean at Penn, and Sheila, Val Sheila Valencia. They were both at the University of Washington at the time. And uh, there was a, I, these are good friends of mine and um, people I really admire and like. And uh, we, the, the, we worked out a research program that we could do across sites. And the data collection concerned the question, why is it that in teacher ed, we tend to emphasize you know, these progressive Deweyan, constructivist, open-ended, activity-oriented teaching methods. And then two years later, we see the teacher teach and it looks like something from 1950. Okay, that was the central problem. You, every teacher educator I know who actually, who doesn't just pay attention to their favorite students, and the ones in the right teaching circumstances. Everyone wonders this. I wondered it in, uh, I wondered it throughout my um, teaching leading up to this. And so that, so that was the question. What is, what is about this transition from progressive teaching teacher ed programs to conservative schools? And that's how it's used. The two worlds pitfall is the mm -hmm. way it's typically been presented. And that's how we presented it in the, in the grant proposal. And, but once the data came in, two things happened. One is the West Coast team was much more interested in looking at sets of people, and I'm much more interested in case studies. Mm -hmm. I, I go a mile deep and an inch wide. Mm -hmm. and they, were, they, were, they were somewhere between that and a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, they, <laughs> you know, their work had a lot of depth to it, but it was, it was spread out more and you know, every, every case you add spreads you a little more thinly mm -hmm. in analysis. And, and we, were, we became interested, we saw different things in the data sets and we, and we, our dispositions were different in terms of how we wanted to approach them. And so once I started looking at the data and, and I was also reading very intensely in Vygotsky at the time, the notion that the problem of concept development became very salient to me I think less so to them. You know, they were they were what they you know, they've published a lot of work out of that. It's good work, but we're, but our interests in it were different. Even though we've done we've done identical data collections, uh, and it may be that doing research in Oklahoma and doing research in Washington in the Seattle area are just very different. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it also, you know, I think it speaks to the fact that we're different people. We, mm -hmm. we, um, I, I'm on the autism spectrum. Doing, doing focused work is very natural to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I see great value in going really, really deep into a, into a narrow thing. Um, so there's, you know, I think your disposition is something that goes beyond just what you uh, intellectually conceive yourself as. You're, you're also built in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, you're built to do some things better than others. So the so those original research questions for me never only partly, you know, I was studying the transition because we had data from student teaching and first jobs uh, covering one or two years. Um, and part of my problem was too was that I moved in the middle of the of the grant period from Oklahoma to Georgia. So instead of having a four year follow, I had two and two, but in two different sites. And that turned out to be very interesting to me because I ended up being able to compare programs. Yeah. Um, which were very, very different and did have different consequences, although probably not the ones you might predict. Um, because they also, it just seems that there are some things that happen in teacher ed that are almost inescapable. Mm -hmm. um, so and my questions became more, th th there's, a, there's a tendency in, in people studying early beginning teachers to say, why did they, they do that? They must be dumb. Mm -hmm. Why are they teaching the five paragraph theme? We taught them not to do that. You know, bad teacher, mm -hmm. or dumb teacher, or something. But I was studying the best, some of the best students we had. Yeah. Uh, I and so that in her first year of teaching, I was up, and every time I went up there, she was teaching five paragraph themes. In teacher ed, no, 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 five paragraph theme, bad, bad, bad. And I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> but she was doing it, and so my, I, and it might be because I. I knew her and I liked her and I thought she was smart and thoughtful. I mean, she, I'd hire this woman. Like, yeah. Why was she teaching the five paragraph theme over and over and over again? And that became what the study was about. Why, what was it? What makes a, a good teacher do bad things, you know? Yeah. And it, it was environmental. It had nothing to do with her shortcomings that she, there was, that first of all, she was teaching eighth grade and there was an eighth grade writing test with a five paragraph theme requirement. Yeah. A rubric, you know, that's, and you know how it is. You teach in these schools and you, your test scores make a big difference. And uh, even though the, the, the principal was very um, open-minded, her, whatever her supervisor was, and said, hey, you know, you our, she, she said, you know, our kids are going to get good scores no matter what. So you don't really have to be doing this. But her, the peers on the faculty would say, oh, your students got good test scores. You must have, the, you know, the, the rich kids or, wow. oh, don't let those scores go. You know, it was the pressure came from somewhere else. Yeah. She always felt it and she always felt stressed by it. And so, and as a student, she'd written a million five paragraph things and been straight A student. Mm -hmm. at school. So what, by looking at deeply into these cases, I was able to find that, you know, these, again, there was this, there was this contradiction in her, been taught one way, taught a different, was encouraged by the principal to teach in a different way, but gave into the pressure of her peers in the state writing test. Um, it was, it was a, a, I was able to do with those studies, what I want to be as a researcher, which is not someone who goes in and finds that, that I don't like what they're doing and then trashing them. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of that kind of research. Um, but to go in to try to understand why people do what they do, and then you're kind of relieving them of the, the blame, if you will, mm -hmm. and trying to assign causes or, or influences, and they are out there. So, and this is a very cultural way of looking at human development. Mm -hmm. We are a product of our environment. Yeah. So that goes back to the, the Vygotsky framing. So. Oh yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, so in terms of case study research, what do you see as the most challenging aspect of, of this research method? Well, first of all, there isn't one case study method. So what, and as I said before, we did, we used the same data collection method as the West Coast people, and they didn't do case studies. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though doing this means you're a case study researcher. Yeah. It really just means you're focusing on small samples. Okay. Uh, very small samples, some uh, often in N of one. And I think the challenge for a, someone studying very small samples is with generalization. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I was told coming through, uh, coming up in the field, your work has to be generalizable. Mm -hmm. Um, but then meantime, there were people saying, no, studying particularity is, is very valuable. Mm -hmm. studying, in, uh, studying exceptions to generalizability is very useful because if you have a big data set that says um, this population does better in school than that population in a very gross sense, it's really important to understand the people who didn't do well in detail because you get a sense of what exceptionality looks like. Mm -hmm. Why are people exceptional? Uh, uh, exceptions to the generalization. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has a uh, great value, but it, you have to argue that very carefully. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give an example of a, of a generalization, uh, of a very cautious generalization that I made, um, because I put these cases, one of the books you referred to earlier was a synthesis of all that work uh, conducted through CELA. And I, I, I would do them case at a time. And I, I, in almost every case except one of, those, one of these two, the first one I just wrote on my own because I, it was such an interesting case to me that I, it was the very first one I did. But then I started analyzing cases with doctoral students mm. and research apprenticeships here. When I worked one-on-one -on -one for two years uh, with each graduate student that I advised. And to do that, I have to take relatively few students. Mm -hmm. I don't have a million grads out there. I have a small number of people who I think uh, learned well. So um, when you do the cases, like I might do this one and then six years later do a different one. Because, and then I've been doing other, I had other lines of inquiry going at the time. So I wasn't necessarily even doing teacher ed studies with all these grad students. I, I didn't necessarily see certain connections that became very evident to me when I started, when I was all done and started looking at the, at the across the cases. Mm. So there was one, the elementary program at Oklahoma was very, had a very clear uh, theoretical orientation in what they called Piagetian construction, constructivism. Uh, learned very erratically, as I found by doing all these interviews. Um, they, they kept saying, well, every one of my professors had a different definition of constructivism, so I'm not even sure what it is. And <laughs> is there, I, you know, I believe in constructivism, but I think there's one way to tie your shoes. So where do you, where do you stop with it? <laughs> and um, so I, I, um, I, the very first one that I'd done was a Native American woman who was terribly out of sync with this school where she did her student teaching, especially in terms of her conception of time. If you've ever done, um, if you've ever read about Native American time conceptions, it's very consistent with a lot of indigenous notions of time, which are uh, what they call, what one perspective calls event time. Um, and the distinction is that Western industrial societies tend to go by clock time. That's why schools, the bell rings, everybody gets up and goes somewhere else and then the bell rings and then you start, you start again, right? That's clock time. Yeah. I'm really good at clock time. I'm the Westernest guy you'll ever meet when it comes to punctuality. Um, not quite so. Uh, I was, so I was interviewing this woman. I had no idea she was Native American uh, because the, the looks, the, they, in Oklahoma, everybody's kind of Native American. Mm. And um, 
the, they don't necessarily have, they might have an Anglo name, they might not have, you know, copper skin and a name like uh, Rolling Thunder or anything like that. She just had an Anglo sounding name. And she was asking me in November, you know what, I'm not quite sure what I want to do uh, these next few weeks. What do you think, uh, you got any ideas? I said, sure, do Thanksgiving. Everybody likes Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite holidays. She said, I hate Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm an Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are good reasons for a Native American not to like Thanksgiving. Yeah. I've learned a lot about them. But then that opened the door to a lot of interesting discussions because uh, she, first of all, she had a great relationship with her mentor teacher. And um, they, they were about the same age. Uh, the, my, the, the student teacher was actually in her mid thirties, had two kids, she was a single mom. And um, she, but she would like uh, story time. Do you know story time in elementary schools? Mm -hmm. well, they sit around, the teacher, they gather, the teacher holds a book like this and reads it upside down while making eye contact with the kids. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a stunning achievement. I don't see, I don't know how they do it. I and, can't. And, hmm? I can't do it. You can't do it. And they conduct a discussion yeah. at all at the same time. So the mentor teacher, and, and she was a terrific teacher and a really lovely woman. I mean, I, these were two people that you would want in your school. She was a really good fit for the, for clock time. And so let's say the lesson was supposed to go from 9.30 to 9.39. It wouldn't go past 9.39. Mm. And if there were 10 kids and seven of them had their hands up, she'd call on two of them to keep it moving along. Oh, okay, yeah. The student teacher would call on kids until the end of time if their hands were still up. She'd run that lesson 20 minutes over mm. because she followed what, uh, what has been described as event time, where you're not driven. You don't do things because it's 2.33. Mm -hmm. You do things because that's what you're doing. Yeah. You're in the moment. It's the event that determines how long you spend on something, not the clock. Mm. And that's a very, there are, and a lot of indigenous scholarship describes some phenomenon like that. Um, clock time is really a, a, a Protestant work ethic value mm. that, that is instilled throughout our educational system. That's why even, you know, universities, the bell rings, or yeah. like, let them go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do. And actually, that was a problem in Brazil, by the way. It was a, that's where I came across these terms. Oh, I, I'm dressed in Molinari, and I came across these terms, clock and event time, to account for this Brazilian problem. Mm -hmm. We also see it in this, um, in this Native American teacher, and it drove her crazy. She, as I said, she loved her mentor teacher. She loved the kids. She hated the way the schedule ran things. Yeah. And she felt terribly alienated by it. And she'd talk about how um, she'd say, hey, when I'm here, I, you know, I, I try my best to fit. When I'm at home, it's Indian time. Yeah. No, the, all the clocks told in her house were set at a different time. Oh. Um, you know, and she didn't care. That's not what she organized herself around. The other one, the, the, the young white woman, and they, again, these are splendid people. I just, I really was fond of all of them. And they were all very bright. They're excellent students. She, she had a mentor teacher who was somewhat dictatorial. She had, she graded under the mentorship of this woman. The, um, the metaphor we developed was, you know, I don't know, people, young people might not get this one, but they used to have dance studios where they actually had footprints on the floor for where you're supposed to step, mm -hmm. and little foot outlines. And that there's a mimetic tradition where you, where you mimic what someone does. And that's what the mentor teacher demanded. You mimic me. Oh, wow. Or this dance floor studio uh, these footprints were a, a kind of an apt metaphor for what she was, ex what was expected of her. But she would always, 
she had a, um, she said something like one time, if I get out of line, she'll bop me back in line. Um, she, she, oh, it was really, she just had no wiggle room. Mm. Very formalist. You know, she was a constructivist. Everything in the class was about being correct. Uh, she couldn't have been more different. Of the two, she's the one who kept, stayed in teaching. Oh, wow. Because she could shrug it off. She'd been to school. She, she was comfortable in this, in this regimented setting. And the other one didn't. She never taught. Hmm. And so, okay, well, we got end of one, one, one subject, one participant in each treatment, you know, in each, uh, can you really do a comparison from this? And this, I'm, this is going way back to answer your question, what's hard about case studies? Yeah. The hard thing about case studies is, is generalizing beyond the case. Is it just an idiosyncratic person that, you know, but on the other hand, we all know people like that. Mm -hmm. like, like the one who went and got the job. We know, we, we know people. So we, you can't generalize to everybody, but you can say this type of, you know, sweet young thing you know, got married the semester after she finished. Uh, she was down the fairway, you know, American as, as, as apple pie. They, they, they can shrug it off. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and learn to fit in. And the Native American one couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so then, okay, that in, a, that in and of itself isn't terribly convincing. Well, this one did this, this did that. But if you look at the statistics on the number of Native American teachers in the workforce, there are hardly any. Uh, the demographic, category, you know, they'll say it's like 85% white. Mm -hmm. Some 80 to 85 percent white, you know, that number moves around a lot. Um, of the remaining 20 percent, say, um, like 9 percent are black, 7 percent are Latin, you know, and we're getting down to no, almost nothing here. Mm -hmm. they, created, they created a category of Native American and like three other demographic types bundled together comprise something like half of 1% of the teaching force. Mm, yeah. Have you ever had a Native American teacher? I haven't. I had some in my classes at Oklahoma, which is a high Native American population. Um, but uh, so when you, when you look at the experience in depth of this teacher and her, her lack of fit with schools and their clock time, you look at the fact that there are hardly any Native American teachers, you maybe make an assumption that most of those are on reservations. You can't just say, we need more black teachers or we need more this. You can't do that without changing the deep structure of the school to accommodate different cultural types. Yeah. So all this talk about diversity is on the surface. Yes, we need, we need diversity. We need more black faces. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to do a damn thing to make the school a place where a black person would want to teach. Yeah, going down or, the structural level. Of, that's right. And, or a Native American person. So how do you, and I would just have this conversation with someone else, and he said, well, you can't really run schools according to uh, event time. I said, well, Montessori school do. Oh, that's a good point. You can. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't. Our schools aren't set up for it as currently run. And as a result, we're going to have the same problems breaking that 80 to 85 percent white monopoly on teaching. Mm -hmm. No one else wants to. Yeah. They never felt good there to begin with. Yeah. You know, if you look, and this is so I think about the deep structure schools, or you think about the, the black kids who get home, sent home for having dreadlocks. Yeah. Uh, um, are they going to want to come back and teach? I um, would, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, again, this gets back to the question of what's hard about case studies, it's arguing from them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's something that uh, when I when I teach this qualitative course that a lot of students come in with this uh, conception of research as science and with science being like the experimental design and the idea that you need a large number in order to have validity. So this is the kind of conversation that I think helps is that it, you don't always need the numbers. We also have to have that close look. Right, so. right. And when I got into the business, there were articles being published like how many subjects. Mm -hmm. In other words, how many people do you need to be in a study in order for it to be valid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've uh, that ha that mainly referred to number crunching. Yeah. Because case studies have been around for a long time, and very you know qualitative methods that don't rely on these you know two thousand person samples have yeah. been around for a long time. So it's a question that applies to some types of work, and I I'm not going to um, dismiss those. They're you know legit in their own right. Mm -hmm. It's just a different right. Yeah, yeah, different different purpose. Um, so along those lines, when you when you are studying just one case or two cases, can you talk a little bit about um, like the selection of participants um, as well as what does it look like to collect and analyze data from yeah. one or two people? So first of all. Uh, participants are all voluntary, so you don't get to pick who's in your research. And so if, any, if anyone says, well, why don't you have more X in your research? They didn't volunteer. <laughs> I, you can't make them be in it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you might try to recruit, but you can't, you know, by and large, you're going with, you, you go and make a pitch to a group of people and you see who volunteers. That's how all of my research has gone. Yeah. So that that's there's actually a different question that you that that you need to ask, which is how do you recruit successfully recruit a broad range, you know, whatever sort of demographics you're looking for in a study, how do you get them to do it? And I've been frankly, most of the people in my studies have been white because I've studied teacher education programs that largely enrolled white people. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some Native, I've had, is she my only Native American? I had one African American guy who, who lost his position. That's a, an interesting story on its own. But you can't study people who don't want to be studied. You can't do it. It's illegal. <laughs> Violates IRB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I guess, the, the simple part of that question is you, you don't get to pick them. Yeah. They pick you. Yeah, so that makes sense. Um, I know I talk to my students a little bit about like purposeful, like seeking out an exact kind of student or, or participant versus kind of just convenience, like whatever is available. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit about what kind of data you collected um, like, for example, in the book group study, what, what, were, what was your data comprised of? Well, that was, that was very simple. Um, we had a bunch of discussions and I turned the recorders on. Okay. Uh, that, that, it was a discussion class. And so that's what I wanted to, dis, to analyze. So I recorded the discussions. Okay. Uh, so that was, um, uh, I would say then when the smaller, much smaller set who agreed to participate in the longitudinal part, um, those were all interview based. Okay. And um, we did a lot of those like this on, uh, I think probably back on Skype or Google Hangouts or something. Okay. Uh, or actually some of them lived in town and they'd come over to my house and we'd talk down here in my study. Okay. So it, it varied over time uh, how we did it. This is actually the cleanest kind of recording because mm -hmm. it's so direct and it's, just easier. You don't have to travel. And in COVID, COVID world, this is about the yeah. only thing you can do. But you know, again, I started uh, those data collections a, a while back. But back in the '90s, when I was doing 
the interviews with the SELA people, they would involve, um, first of all, classroom observations because interview data can be very unreliable. Mm -hmm. um, most teachers give the best version of themselves in an interview. Mm -hmm. And they'll even shift the truth around a little bit to enhance their appearance. Mm -hmm. and because they're human, you know, yeah. it's not, these aren't character flaws, they're human. Um, so they, they would begin, we'd have a, 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 let's say you're the teacher on, on, uh, who's in the research. I would start with a pre-observation interview because what we were trying to do is um, get a sense not only of what we were seeing, but how it emerged. And then afterwards, we try to get a sense of how it would follow. We do three observation cycles in a semester. And if you do this, you can get a sense of what goes on in between the observations. So I would, I would probably call you the night before and we do an interview over the phone and I, I used to have a little device that you could stick between a, you know, a landline phone and a tape recorder. Okay. And it would, uh, you know, now of course you just push a button on your phone and it records. But uh, this was, I was using cassette, cassettes to record things on and these probably things I don't even make anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to capture the, to get, a, to get the best recording quality. Or sometimes I'd meet with them, um, but even that's, uh, there was one woman that I, who was in the research, who had a, who was from a very, very conservative Christian background. And I say this because her husband was a very patriarchal man in their relationship mm -hmm. and very paternalistic. And I'd be interviewing her at her house and he would try to take over the interview from somewhere else in the room. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it became clear to me that the only way to interview with her was in person. Mm -hmm. uh, and even, I think, I think she was the same one I would interview and her mentor teacher was in the room and she would try to take over the interview. Interesting. So to get this woman alone to interview her, um, took some doing, but you know, after a while, I figured out how to do it because she was she was she was very deferential. Okay. And uh, she was a Southern woman who uh, a, a, a deep South woman who had been raised to be a deferential female. Mm -hmm. So I had to I had to work to isolate her so that she, just she and I could talk. Yeah. Uh, so this also reminds me of some of the weird stuff um, when I interviewed the, the Native American woman in her school one time, you know, you try to have to try to find a quiet place in a school. That's not always easy. Yeah. We interviewed, um, I interviewed her in what amounted to a utility closet one time. Oh, wow. And as I, as we came out, I thought, oh, this would look really bad if someone saw us coming out of the utility closet. Oh, it's a good thing you have the recording. Yeah, it was a good thing. <laughs> All we were doing was talking. <laughs> so the perils of doing research in schools, you know, just finding a place where you can do an interview can be true. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the data analysis? So um, when, you, when you're just doing like the interviews, you have the, the transcripts. Yeah. Um, and then observations, you have notes. Can you talk a little bit about what that looked like for you? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I've always had a transcriptionist. There are people who say, oh, you, you have to transcribe your own tapes. There, are, First of all, some people think there might be ethical issues with a third party hearing them that might violate IRB. Mm. Um, some people think that only you can engage with the data. I, uh, I've taken the shortcut and hired it out. Mm. And you know, there's not as though they're saying anything in the data that are gonna that's incriminating, and they're talking about teaching. Yeah. You know, this was this was this was not racy stuff. <laughs> so I I felt I've always felt comfortable doing that, and I've actually found that a lot of the people who preach must transcribe your own data actually don't do that at all. <laughs> but they tell students they must. Mm, okay. So that, that, but that's an important stage. It's got to get from the recorder to the page. Yeah. 
somehow. And I, I either had grant money to get it done or it got pulled into a research assistance uh, work or I, there was a transcription company. I, I got money somehow, I can't remember how, and was able to just hire it out. I think they're in California, but the, you know, you don't, with Dropbox, you just put it there, they pick it up and then they email it back to you. So um, then, then comes the analysis part. And uh, the way I've set up my life, I, as I, I said before, I accept maybe one student a year and we work for two years in uh, about three hours a week, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And it, we used to do it the, on campus. We started doing it here at my house and now everything's on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And even when I had uh, graduate students who, had, who lived far away or had childcare issues, I'd say, don't spend an hour and a half driving let's just set this up on Skype or Zoom or whatever. And, and that way your kid can run around in the background and you know, your life's a whole lot easier if we just do this like this. And it's not, it's actually a little more efficient. Mm -hmm. we, tend, we tend to uh, talk about other things when they're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's kind of a social dimension to research. Yeah. So, um, that I would work one on one with a graduate student, and there's a, and we'd code, and we I use coding schemes, and um, I try to make them matter. In other words, I, I, the, the codes have to have a yield, or else they're not very useful, and they're also aligned with what I look at from a Vygotskyan perspective. So I, there's a there are a set of um, factors you can look at across cases, even if the cases are very different. So um, what is the goal of the activity? There's a goal to every activity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it matters what it is. It's, it sets the direction for what you do. Um, there is a, a setting for every activity. It takes place somewhere. Mm -hmm. And making inferences about how that setting shapes um, activity is very important. And uh, there are tool use, what we call tool use in this uh, line of work is also involved when people are making or doing things. You do sort of psychological or material tools. Mm -hmm. So those, you, if you have a set of categories that are stable, you populate them once you're in a case with what the case gives you. Mm -hmm. And they may be radical. Like, so the five paragraph theme was the, um, instructional tool, pedagogical tool, in one case, but not in any other. Okay. And then that, 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 was, that was kind of what gave us the lead on what to, uh, what to analyze. And so I work side by side or, or screen to screen with a, with a second coder and we walk and we just discuss everything. Mm -hmm. And so in the old days and probably still today, there's a notion of um, analytic reliability. And so if, when I did my dissertation, I coded the data, I trained another person in how to do the coding, and she looked at, I don't know, 10 or 15% of the data, and the point was to have 80% agreement or more. Okay. In other words, my, the, the coding was reliable if you agreed more or less, or for the most part, with what I did. Mm -hmm. And I was actually persuaded very early by a friend of mine named George Newell that that, that kind of training is a little disingenuous because it's not so much you're getting reliability, but you're getting, you're, you're coercing the person to agree with, <laughs> yeah. with you see things. Yeah. And I think it puts the other person in a very subordinate role. There's not my, it, their, their job is to try to mimic you. Yeah. Their job is not to participate in the analysis and, and offer their insights. And I try to recruit good students because I want a smart person who will challenge me. Mm -hmm. I tell them, you're, you're no value if you just sit there and agree with me. It's your job to say if you think something else. And I try to imp impress that on them early. 
So rather than getting reliability from this separate coding and agreement, I've argued that reliability follows from the fact that two people are working over time on something and every code you make is provisional because you might, you know, usually what happens is we do a lot of coding and then we look at the whole thing and we start to, uh, to what they call collapse codes. In other words, move them together uh, so that you don't have a, a thousand codes. I thought you can't make sense of saying a thousand different things happen once each. Mm -hmm. But you can make sense of saying on on 25 occasions she taught the para five paragraph theme, mm -hmm. and so there, there's this process that you you go through an initial coding process, and we use a program called Atlas TI. I've been using that for 20 some years now. Um, I like it, but there are you know there are other qual programs out there. I'm not particularly pitching this one. Um, and so we code, and then we, we move from the codes in the software to a chart that lists them all, and that's where we discuss them again. Yeah. You know, things might, there might be a lot of shifting in that second stage, but also the process of discussing them is very generative in thinking about the data. Mm -hmm. so all the coding you do is not only analytic but generative in how you think about the next thing you do or the last thing you do. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the way I like to relate to another person. I feel that the other person is, is a much more a partner than an assistant. Um, and they always get co-authorship. So it's, you know, I try to extend, I've, I've never found that my career has been compromised by sharing authorship. Yeah. Uh, I know people who never co-author, but they have an acknowledgement that says, and thanks to my trusty research assistant, so-and-so, and I think uh, that, that's not much capital. Yeah. That's, that's not going to serve you on the job market, whereas a publication is, you know, that's gold. Yeah. Uh, when, if your goal is to teach in a university. Yeah. So that, but to me, it's a very fluid data analysis. Of a very, it's a very fluid process. And I'll, well, I'll let me give you an example of how how fluid it can be. The notion of empathic framing mm -hmm. that was actually suggested to, to us by a reviewer of wow. a manuscript we submitted, and we had missed it with wow. all the stuff we were doing in there. She said, you know, you really ought to look at the work on empathic framing. Um, well, and that sent us back and we, we, we did a new analysis just looking at that. Oh, wow. So, you know, you're, uh, the idea that there's some solitary researcher is completely wrong because yeah. you're doing, it's a social process. You get feedback, you go through editors, you go through reviewers. Um, I was a journal editor for seven years, and frankly, you're co-author of everything you publish because <laughs> you put a lot of work into each manuscript that you accept. So there's a there's a um, it, the idea even of sole authorship is always a bit deceptive mm -hmm. because you got a lot of feedback to get you into the journal. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, uh, this, we may look at this in another question. Um, well, I, it'll come up here when we talk about a little bit about quality and rigor. Um, I'm just thinking about uh, the idea of member checking in terms of yeah. having participants uh, look at what you've uh, delineated and seeing if that matches their conception. Can you talk a little bit about that and about um, kind of how you think about uh, you, I mean, you talked about the inner rate of reliability, but can you also talk about things like triangulation, like yeah. um, uh, and and researcher subjectivity? Well, I like to. I, I, I prefer corroboration to triangulation. Okay. Um, in other words, it supports it, but it doesn't prove it. Okay. I think triangulation suggests a proof. Okay. But what you're getting is a certain sort of uh, corroboration or confirmation of what you're. Um, what you're, what you think you see. And so that's why, for instance, um, 
the observations are important in a, a teacher interview can tell you something, but if it's corroborated by an observation, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a more solid piece of evidence. Yeah. And, you know, again, if you avoid the language of proof and you're, you're, you're engaging in argumentation, it's a social act and, you know, persuasion uh, is a function of who believes the evidence you're, you're giving. Mm -hmm. So it's again, it's never a proof. It's always an argument, and that's what a research report is. It's an argument. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked about, uh, I guess, uh, triangulation and what? Oh well, when you were talking about kind of the the constructed uh, collaborative nature yeah. of like the coding and the interpretation and how it's like a social act in and of itself, I also wondered if if that pulls into um, kind of talking to your participants and seeing- Oh, them. member checks and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you and I have a mutual friend who argues heatedly against member checking. <laughs> uh, and in the type of work that she does, she, I think, takes the perspective that you can't be an honest critic if you have to get the per person's permission to say it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not exactly what I do. Uh, I prefer to get, um, uh, to see if the person thinks I'm right. Mm -hmm. And in many, many of these cases, the teacher was listed as a co-author. Oh, wonderful. And in fact, even often wrote like a little, uh, epilogue at the end oh, of the day, like a coda or whatever to comment on the analysis and then got authorial credit. Um, great. I, I included the teacher in, as co-author every time I could. Sometimes they didn't turn in the paperwork. Sometimes I couldn't find them. Yeah. You know, because I did the, and I'd moved from Oklahoma to Georgia and I, they got married and changed their name or something, you know, or else I wrote them and I never wrote back, things like that. But I also was able to track down some of the kids I studied. I, you know, teachers are one population I've studied. I've also studied kids. And one of the studies, um, if you've seen the article, uh, Bullshit in Academic Writing, the kid that we studied, I love this kid, um, and because she had gone to Norman High, and that's, uh, that's where I studied her, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and then she'd gone to OU, and her teacher had then come into the doctoral program and had stayed in touch with the girl. So we, we had access to her. She was she was she came to my office on campus and I actually reconstructed a um, uh, a body biography from the from the transcript. Oh wow! Yeah, she was she was something else. So she's a co-author. Oh, that's wonderful. So I got in that case. Yeah, so the, sometimes the members are teenagers. Yeah. And have ended up as co-authors. I can't find them all. You know, because you collect data, it might, it, if I had big data collections going on, I couldn't do every study right away. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the 2020 book includes data from 1999, 1997 to 8. So, um, but one, one thing I think is, if you study concept development and not state-of-the-art instruction, it doesn't matter as much when it was collected mm -hmm. because you're looking at how you're, you're, you're situating and you're situating a, a cognitive or, or, or social process in, in a time and place. And as long as you situate it, that's what matters. Okay. You know, human nature is not going to change in 10 years. Yeah. Right. And so you're, you're going to, um, it doesn't have to be, data collected last year, unless you're doing COVID studies or, yeah. uh, or Black Lives Matters in, you know, these last couple of years, mm -hmm. right? there is a, there is a time and, you know, timestamp on that stuff for it to be useful. Yeah. Um, but not if what you're studying is how people develop over time. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, a follow-up question. Um, so, 
the idea that you know that it's important to have the, the voices of your participants and including them um, not only in looking at you know what you've observed and what you've concluded but then letting them you know have authorship to me that that kind of circles back around to like the Vygotskyan notion of you know meaning and learning being socially constructed do you see that kind of as looping through that or is there a different way that that you conceptualize that well, no no it's all um I, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable positioning everything as uh social and constructed okay including the process of doing the work mm -hmm. and also everything's provisional and tentative you know as i said we had a we had a study we thought was done and then someone said oh you didn't look at the right thing yeah and so and that's actually in review now who's who knows where who's no who knows what's going to become of it although i think we finally got it right this time it's been uh it's taken us a long time some studies are harder to do with than others and i think one of the big tricks for me and a lot of people is if you do a big qualitative collection producing 30 page studies from it is very challenging because mm -hmm. you're kind of overwhelmed by all the data. And then one of the problems I had was I tried to write one article on the whole thing on, on all these processes from a whole semester. And it was just, it was unwieldy. They are, you know, the manuscript was like 80 pages long. Yeah. And people just don't want to read anything like that. Yeah. Um, well, another question kind of drawing from that, um, a lot of times when I'm first introducing qualitative work to students, especially when they read pieces that are, because there's, you know, you'll find qualitative articles that are structured very much like a quantitative article and use third person. Um, but then there's obviously articles where the, the author uses the first person and things like right. that. Um, and in those ones, you see a lot more of like a researcher reflexivity or positionality right. state. Can you talk about what that looks like for you when you're talking about yourself as a researcher and bias and things like that? Yeah, uh, it, that's, that's a good question. I would say it kind of depends. So there was a, I'll just give an ex one example and maybe that'll start us off. So there was one study I did of a Native American student back in Oklahoma. And we published it in, or we submitted it to, and it eventually got published in the Journal of American Indian Education edited, you know, kind of owned and operated by Native American people. Although I think Terry McCarty was the editor and she's white, but she's in with uh, the Native community. And, um, oh, we had to do an extensive justification for why we could be in that journal. Mm. What's this white boy doing in this journal? Yeah. And it turned out, I didn't even realize it, both of my co-authors had a Creek background, Creek tribe. Oh, okay. So and one was the teacher, co-author. One was my, my graduate student here. Uh, we were doing the analysis several years later, quite a few years later, because I was over here already by then. And so that was a journal that said no subjectivity statement, no publication. Yeah. Um, and I had to justify as a, a white guy why I had the, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a, a theme or whatever in out there called the right to write. Mm, yeah. Who has the right to write about such and such a population? Can men write about women? Mm -hmm. Can white people write about black people? In this case, can white people who turned out to have some Native American heritage write about a, a this was a, uh, a kid who looked really Indian too. He had copper skin. He had his hair, long hair tied back, um, and and all the data that came out of him was uh, was pretty fascinating. But so yeah, that subjectivity statement absolutely there. Um, and all these things though, you're you get you have a page or word count that you have to stick in, stick with mm -hmm. every sentence you add to your subjectivity statement is analysis you're not doing. Mm -hmm. So you, there's this, um, 
tension that you constantly have in writing for publication of meeting all these requirements well without overdoing it and without underdoing it. Mm -hmm. um, there was just something I was asked to review for a service learning journal and they spent a number of pages explaining what service learning is and part of what I said was you need to do this here. You know in a different kind of journal where the readers don't know what it is Mm -hmm. Sure, but in a service learning journal, yeah, it, do you need to explain in this kind of detail what it is? I, I don't know the answer, but it's a, it's what I pointed out as a reviewer. Yeah. Um, so I, it, and actually as a reviewer, I started starting reviews with a subjectivity statement. Mm. Here's my position as a researcher. You know, you just sent me an article on Swedish elementary school class. I'm not Swedish. I never taught elementary school. Um, so, you know, I'm not ideal, but I, you know, it's usually they send it to me because they take a sociocultural look at you know, literacy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, I do know something about that, uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, I, I think that the positionality of any any stakeholder in any process is important. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, that, I don't, you don't usually see that to that extent in quantitative research. I mean, they may say they have a grant through such and such, but it's, right. it's something that students notice that's different. So. There is some, I had a, used to have a neighbor in psychology in our psych department here who looked at, um, it's like geriatric mental, issues like dementia. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd be a good subject for him about this point in life, but uh, he, he, he said, oh yes, we always have to include a statement like, um, my mother has Alzheimer's. Oh. And that's my stake in this discussion. Interesting, okay. And that's the kind of, instead of saying so-and-so teaches here and uh, won such and such an award, it's so-and-so teaches here and his mother has Alzheimer's. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, it's kind of an ethics, conflict of interest uh, uh, statement. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you're right. You don't, in a, in a typical big number crunching study, the author doesn't say, I'm, a, I'm an old white guy or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and may not be relevant, but, but may. Yeah. Um, so uh, the last couple questions, um, uh, first, I guess I'll, I'll ask, is there anything that I haven't asked you about your research in particular that you'd like to share uh, with my students? Uh, the only thing I'd say is I'm, I'm really only give you a, giving you a partial look and so I've, I've had a career that most advisors don't recommend, which is that it's had, it's been multi-topic. Mm. Um, it's been, the, the thread that holds together is the sociocultural lens. I mean, so I've got a whole line of inquiry going back about 10 years now on um, autism research. Mm -hmm. And that came out of my own uh, recognition when my daughter got diagnosed that I, well, that's me. And so then I started reading Vygotsky's work in defectology, which is a terrible name for a, ter a really important line of work. Um, but he, he looks at the, the social environment of people considered disabled mm -hmm. and makes it the case that the problem isn't what is different about them, it's how we treat them. Mm. And uh, it's really powerful stuff. And um, so, but my point is simply, and I've studied kids doing art, interpreting literature through art and character education and a lot of, so I've done a lot of things, but I keep cycling around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'm a little richer every time I return um, because I see things better through a warp than I do a direct lens. Mm -hmm. um, and so the typical advice that you get is, how can you describe yourself so that it could fit on a bumper sticker? Well, that's my own metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'm a post-structural feminist 
this crit? Yes. Researcher. You know, boom, right on the license, you know, right on the bumper sticker. And um, the careers like mine are actually not recommended because people view you as unfocused. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of, my, and you also don't have this like 25 years of building up of a credibility with, in, in your niche. Mm -hmm. And I, I busted out of my niche a whole, a whole lot. But so when I was, I, I had a job interview before I moved here in the mid nineties. And I was told I didn't get the position because I, I lacked focus. I said, you're unfocused. We, we need someone who, you know, who we can put on that bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. And now that I've successfully done that, if you consider publication a mark of success, now I'm considered broad. Mm. A different way of seeing it. The exact same thing. Yeah. So um, that I will say that the 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 typical career has um, a much greater, much better focus than mine. Topically, mm -hmm. I study family literacy. I study uh, African American community literacy. Yeah, I'm a literacy person, so that's what pops into my head. And not someone who does mental health here and interpreting literature there and service learning here and character ed there, um, that, that's discouraged. Mm -hmm. And I think most people would have a hard time finding a center to that. But to me, it's been uh, the way my mind works. I'd be bored stiff if all I did, if I were a writing researcher and that's all. That's when my dissertation was a writing research study. Mm -hmm. Um, that included number crunching. Uh, this was 1989. Yeah. And uh, a, a, a very primitive and um, uh, viewed a, a different t tests, which are considered the weakest form of analysis. But it was it was it was a small. There weren't enough. I didn't have big numbers, so yeah. Uh, it was an it was a kind of a it was an unusual study, but. So I would say that the advice you're going to get, which is the advice that carries most people, is to be focused. And uh, to give an, another example, I knew someone who was going up for tenure at a Research One university. And her senior faculty mentors said to her, it's not clear to us whether your line of inquiry is in teacher education or English education. Mm. It had to be that specific. Wow! Yeah. So they would have they wouldn't know what to do with me. <laughs> yeah. Except except, tell me to go somewhere else probably. <laughs> so I think that's I think that's good advice for doctoral students. Um, and would you would would you say in terms of qualitative methodology, do you have any advice for students in, these are ed leadership students, um, but it could also just be, you know, any students in the education field um, about their own dissertation study and thinking about qualitative methods? Well, first of all, I would say don't buy into the dichotomy between qual and quant. Okay. I use descriptive statistics in my qualitative work. And although that would probably, the people in my college who view qualitative research as a religion probably wouldn't have me. <laughs> um, they, they think of something else. Um, so I think that that dichotomy is false and unproductive and it produces a lot of unnecessary disputes over who's got the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, the right research method is the one that answers your research questions. That's mm -hmm. pretty simple. Um, another thing I've said is education is too complicated for any paradigm to have the only answer. Mm -hmm. And so keep your, you know, listen to people who do other sorts of work. Um, try to appreciate what they have to offer and don't rule them out because some professor you had didn't like their paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, I have a friend who did a, what's called an expert novice study for her dissertation. Um, which by and large, you, you take people who've never done something and people who've done it a lot, 
and compare how they do it mm -hmm. and show that the experts, you know, the seasoned people have more sophisticated ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, one implication of that that some people read is we need to teach the novices the things that the professionals, the experts do. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, that's an expert novice study. Uh, the discussant at the session didn't like expert novice studies and humiliated the person presenting her dissertation research. Oh, that's... It was, it was just, a, a, I, I had coffee with the person who got skewered afterwards and she was devastated. Oh, wow. And she published that study in one of the most competitive journals that there is. I won't, I don't want to give away anybody's identity here. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I would say is that I think qualitative research isn't a very good uh, category because it includes so many very different ways of working. Yeah. Um, which may emerge from different paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for instance, I've done uh, early in my career, I've done a lot of something called protocol analysis, which is having people talk out loud while they're working so you can try to trace how they think. Mm -hmm. And the, the, that was an information pro I came out of grad school doing information processing. Uh, that was my paradigm and I flipped pretty quickly to sociocultural. But um, the, uh, one of the things I did was took protocol analysis and reconceived it as a sociocultural research tool. Oh, interesting. So just because you read in some methods textbook that something is a certain way doesn't mean that that's the way it can only be. Mm -hmm. That's excellent advice. Yeah. Because within a like case study design, different you know scholars have different way of presenting it in their methods books. Right. So. Right. Well, to close, I wanted to see if you would offer any questions that you would have my students continue to think about um, after listening to this to, to help them reflect or just questions that you think would be important for them to think about more broadly. Yeah, well, so here, that's, that's, that's often a way to conclude these. And um, I've, I've done this before and like, or people will say, what do you think people ought to be studying? Mm -hmm. what's, what's the network? Let's look into the future. What, what kind of research do we need? And my answer to that is probably both unsatisfying and maybe very satisfying, mm -hmm. which is I'm, I'm, I'm a person of my time and place. You know, I study the things that a person of my age and background tend to look into. Mm -hmm. Those are the questions I know how to ask. But those aren't necessarily the questions that need to be asked as things move forward. And I'll give one um, example of that. One of the things, one of the, I, I call this a proud moment. Um, I, I was the founder of something called the Cultivating New Voices Among Scholars of Color uh, grants program for the NCTE Research Foundation. And the idea was to create cohorts of scholars of color who, who who and have them work with mentors over a two year period, but also not just be mentored, but to assert what they know. Mm. Because a young uh, Latin uh, person from Los Angeles will just have a different bunch of questions than I ever could. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a 30 year old black person may have very different questions from a 60 year old black person you know the times are they grow up in different times they see different things they have different experiences and so people coming up they, they might see inequities that aren't as in, as apparent to me mm -hmm. and i think some of the most stimulating work to come out of ncte has come out of these cultivating new voices cohorts because they're asking questions that the vast majority of people who are white in the council, it never occurs to even ask them. Mm. And so I don't, you know, I don't know your students. I don't know who they are or, or where they're from, probably Virginia. 
which is my home state. I grew up in Alexandria. Uh, the, their socialization and their experiences are going to create a perspective that might produce different and better questions that I could ever think of suggesting that they ask. Okay. And so what I think they should do is see what their own, so when I, back, back when I was uh, starting my career, I was studying students interpreting literature through art. Nobody else had done that. And um, if I had stuck to what other people were doing, I'd have been a down the fairway composition researcher. Mm -hmm. And I would have been like all the other comp researchers who didn't like my work at the time and said, why would you want to study kids dancing out of song interpretation? That's stupid. <laughs> but it turned out to be something I really learned a lot from. And I, you know, I got published in, I think it's now JLR, it used to be Journal of Reading Behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I asked, and that was based on teaching experiences I'd had in a school where we, where that sort of thing was uh, practiced. So I, I, was, I was able to do some things that other people weren't doing because I had a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. And, but now I'm 67 years old, now I'm the old fart. Mm -hmm. And your students are the ones who are gonna have these fresh new perspectives. And that's what I think that they should be cultivating. Okay, that's excellent advice and something they though obviously cultivate across this course and, and going forward. Good. Well, thank you for your, your ample time that you've given to this. And I, I know the students will, will enjoy listening to this interview. Well, you see, we went with event time, not clock time. <laughs> we did. We did. Our half hour uh, became an hour and a half, I think. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. All right. Hey, it's great to see you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.